All right, so this is basically just an introduction to the Internet of Things and um, a loose introduction to mesh networking. So there's a lot of complexities in here, and this is really just an introduction. So basically, all the things and why they should talk. He was talking about the refrigerator just now. Um, that'll tell you when the doors open or you know, any of those uh, important tidbits of information when you're running out of milk or maybe when something's rotting in the, uh, in the fruit drawer. So that's why you might want to do stuff. And the Internet of Things is basically when it is basically created, or the intranet, preferably, of things is basically created when any of these devices that we have around us hop on a network and start exchanging their information. Um, so that brings up a couple problems. I mean, all of a sudden your fridge needs a firmware update and is a spam bot. So you should take some precautions if you're doing this yourself. And if you're having someone else do it, like Philips, then you should probably be aware that they have their own problems. So that said, they've had that for a long time. Spam bot fridges are kind of years old. So appliances are still last decade. Nowadays, it's all about the smart gear. So that's a shirt that actually monitors your heart rate and a number of other um, uh, bio statistics, bio data. And it'll do things like communicate with your wife when you're stressed. Maybe you've got a big presentation. Um, so that's, that's one of the things they use in one of their uh, little intro videos. And it's kind of humorous. So uh, now the devices like to talk, and we obviously do as well. They've been known to, and we've been doing this for a while on Twitter, and on like Facebook, you know, when you're, you'll have your fridge update you on Twitter. So you might want to let your family know where you are, or your doctor know when you're not feeling well, or the EMS know when you're not feeling at all. And of course, that means NSA and other governments know as well. So probably not, we probably don't have to worry about North Korea, but that is something to be aware of. Again, the Internet of Things means that everything you do is available. So you should be taking precautions to make sure that it's not available to everyone, just you and the people you want to see it. So how do they communicate? There's a couple different technologies that we all know and we see all the time. Um, and they have their be benefits and negatives. Major uh, con is that they're all high power. So these are the four that we see all over the place. And microwave, it sounds like weird, but most of us, like some of us will know that microwave towers are what we see all over the place. And microwave is really just line of sight um, RF communication. So Wi-Fi is one of the ones that we're most familiar with and one of the quote unquote older ones as far as devices communicating in our homes. However, it's kind of new to the smart device area because it's not the most secure. It kind of, um, you can join networks or you might get a device, again, like a fridge, and it might join your Wi-Fi network, or it might accidentally join your neighbors, and then you don't know where it's going. So because of those, we've got a couple of different um, other protocols and other systems that are basically made to communicate from device to device or from device to your central node and what have you. So Bluetooth, we all know of. And now Bluetooth Low Energy has been merged into Bluetooth 4.0, which is really kind of cool. But Bluetooth has its own problems. Uh, Z-Wave, Zigbee, InOcean, Insteon, these are the guys that seem to be running the um, home networking or the smart home kind of stuff right now. Zigbee, we, some of y'all may have heard of because that seems to be the go-to for the hobbyist hacker. Um, Z-Wave has quite a few clients and the others, unfortunately, I don't know much about. I haven't ever used InOcean or Insteon, but InOcean seems pretty cool. It is so low power that you can run without a battery and harvest your energy from the device's actions, or even uh, switch presses. Um, waveness and UWB. UWB is what we used to call pulse radio, so it broadcasts on a broad spectrum and just pulses its information. It's, it's kind of limited, um, but it's got its applications. So you saw a couple of those said mesh by them. So what is the mesh network? It's when these devices can communicate from one device to another and also hopefully route communications from that to another location. So it's point to point communication or node to node. Each of these points on this network are called nodes. 
So, um, oh yeah, so basically the hope is that any node on this network can route information for all the other nodes. And that typically comes down to, in Zigbee at least, that's the one I have the most experience with. You're usually communicating to a coordinator or from a coordinator, but you can go through all the other nodes in the network. Theoretically, because it's dynamic and routes packets as needed, so if that node I can get to, but I can't get to the coordinator, I'll send to that node, and that node will send to whoever to get there. Because it's dynamic, it means that we can get bigger and faster networks and have much higher reliability. If one node fails, it doesn't matter, which actually, which actually means that it's got a lot of applications in third world countries extending Wi-Fi um, because you don't really have um, a lot of gateways. You'll have one place over here, a city that can upload and download and whatever from the internet, but all these other people need internet access. So they've been setting up a lot of large-scale Wi-Fi mesh networks where each node communicates to the others and then you get like one laptop per child which uses mesh networking so that if one of these laptops can get to the internet, the rest can as well as long as we've got multiple avenues. Um, and as you can imagine, if you've only got one gateway to the net, it can slow down. So the hope is that you would have multiple and it's all dynamically arranged. There's a bunch of protocols for all of that. Um, so to see how this all works, there's a couple different uh, components that kind of come together. There's the coordinator, at least, and again, this is more geared towards Zigbee because that's what I have to work with. Um, but there's, there's, for the most part, most of the mesh networks work similarly. Um, there's a coordinator which generally does the administrative work. It'll decide what frequency the network's gonna live on. It'll decide its, um, its uh, network address or ID and it'll maybe lock the network down or uh, control who can join or that nobody can join the network. Um, then you've got the router, which actually is routers. Hopefully almost every node on the network can be a router for the other nodes. And then you might have an end node. And the re it seems kind of counterintuitive after showing all the benefits of having all of these nodes able to route packets say, I want this node set to only send and receive. But that uses a lot less power. So you might have a node over here that actually goes to sleep when it's not sending or receiving. So maybe there's a sensor monitoring the methane in your fruit drawer. And then when, it, when it's got enough data, the node wakes up, sends off a couple packets, and then shuts down. So all in all, this is just a little dot you stick in your fruit drawer, and it isn't some big wiring and mess. So what does this look like? A basic network, you've got your coordinator and you've got your end nodes. And this is, I mean, this is just so you can co communicate from an end node to the coordinator. This composes a topology called a star. So every node can communicate with every other node, but only through the coordinator. The coordinator routes everything. So that can be, you know, that's got its own limitations. So you've got the tree where you've got a router in some place which will uh, extend the network and you can get packets from other end nodes. And again, you can communicate. So if one of these end nodes wants to communicate to another end node, that is generally possible. Um, so you expand the tree. Well, if you make every one of them routers, that's what you actually call a, net, a mesh where, well, not everyone, but the majority of them, you'll have, um, you'll have your packets routed all over and however you need, which allows for a lot of adaptability. So if this was a geographic area and you were to expand that network to really push the limits, then you maybe have an obstacle thrown in, then the network needs to adapt. So it will. So now if a packet needs to go from one end node to the controller, then it'll find the best route, which is usually the, it doesn't worry about the number of hops so much as the length of the hops because that's where you lose information in Wi-Fi. So here you can see two different end nodes sending their data down to the controller. So, I mean, I want all of the data about everything I do. I want to know what my fridge is doing and what all these other, what my health is doing and et cetera. So I want 
all of these smart things. But of course, we don't want to go out and buy them. There's any number of reasons we wouldn't want to do that. Um, and on the other hand, there's a number of products that are really quite remarkable that are coming out. One that was kind of odd and interesting, there's a couple different toilet manufacturers. One was a scam, uh, well, not a scam, but a joke kind of thing to start conversation up in Toronto that'll, that was supposedly seeing, you know, what sex is, you know, using the restroom and uh, just general biometrics. And there's actually in Japan a couple that'll do things even so far as use like the uh, biometrics on a chip to tell if you're pregnant or not, which would be kind of cool. Um, any number of these things. I mean, I'd like to know if my kidney's failing. Um, but yeah, so on the other hand, we can make these. Zigbee is a protocol that any one of us can go out and buy and throw onto an Arduino and throw in a couple sensors and all of a sudden know what's going on. So yes, we can go get the smart watch, which I'm probably going to end up doing, or not the watch, probably. I want to know my biometrics. But so we can go out and get these devices, but we can also make them. Um, hopefully, in the meetings to come, we're hoping, if I can get my st stuff together, to have a couple presentations where we try to kind of get the intro to all that stuff out there. So that's basically what I got. <laughs>